Coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. The spirit of, well, you know, times are changing. And so, uh, and so we're, we're going to go forward, uh, which is the, the name of, of Macron's uh, sort of Frankenstein party that he cobbled together uh, as, you know, as the socialists and, and, uh, and the Sarkozy wing of, of the right in France collapsed. So, so you know, Zemmour shows without, uh, without telling really that or, or reserving just a few lines to the fact of the matter. That the those in charge have have willfully and deliberately let go of of France and have you know put a a stake through its heart as they sort of push it out out to sea, and he shows and not tells that that what is replacing it is not something worth pride, not something worth sacrifice, not something that arouses joy or hope. Welcome, everyone, once again to The Roundtable, the publisher's and editor's podcast. Here at the American Mind at the Claremont Institute, I'm your host, Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute, publisher of the American Mind and the Claremont Review Books. I'm joined by James Bullis, executive editor of the American Mind, Spencer Clavin, associate editor of the Claremont Review Books and features editor of the American Mind, and Seth Barron, managing editor of the American Mind. Uh, but let's kick off with um, a little bit of a reading. Many of you probably have seen notice of by now this uh, speech, launching presidential speech for Eric Zemmour in France. Uh, it's caused quite a stir. He kind of replicated the delivery and backdrop of de Gaulle's speech to France that he delivered from London during uh, World War II. And uh, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary for its existence, for its composition, uh, for just the the interesting fact that you know Zemmour is now Algerian Jew turned Frenchman, slight joke. He's assimilated quite well because it was just announced recently that he had um, that his uh, mistress who works for him was having his baby, so he's fully assimilated into French culture. Um, but the uh, all jokes aside, uh, this is worth reading, and it's not that long, uh, and it's pretty arresting, and it's a new marker, I think, in the um, uh, evolution of the nationalist populist right wing, if I can be very broad with all those terms, insurgency across uh, Western Europe and America. Uh, I don't think this is going anywhere. And uh, it, it's, it will be interesting to continue to track both the possible statesmen that take it up, uh, the demagogues that abuse it, and the uh, effects it will have on, a, on, I think, a European establishment that thought this sort of thing could never happen again, but is now rearing its, its head. I sh will say also, just as at the outset, everyone should go and look at the newest edition of the Claremont Review books, pretty much hot off the presses. There's a nice long essay in there from Chris Caldwell, who's an expert on France, uh, speaks and reads French, travels there a lot, has reported on France for a long time. What's the title, Spencer? Is it French's Civil War? France on the verge of civil war, yeah. France on the verge of civil war. Thank you. So here's, um, here's a rough translation, but the Powerline guys posted up. I think they got it off uh, Twitter feed. But French is pretty easy to translate, so it's probably pretty close. So I should say that if you don't know the de Gaulle backdrop, it's, uh, it's pretty arresting. It's kind of an old-timey microphone that Zamora tried to recreate. And it's uh, kind of wood-paneled bookshelves behind him with, with a bunch of books. And uh, that's it, pretty, pretty minimalist. And a speech in front of him that he's reading. For years, the same feeling has swept you along, oppressed you, shamed you. A strange and penetrating feeling of dispossession. You walk down the streets in your own towns, and you don't recognize them. You look at your screens and they speak to you in a language that is strange and in the end foreign. You turn your eyes and ears to advertisements, TV series, football matches, films, live performances, songs, and the school books of your children. You take the subways and trains. You go to train stations and airports. You wait for your sons and your daughters outside their school. You take your mothers to the emergency room. You stand in line at the post office or the employment agency. You wait at a police station or a courthouse, and you have the impression that you are no longer in a country that you know. You remember the country of your childhood. You remember the country that your parents told you about. You remember the country you've found in books and films. Forgive me, uh, listeners, I will butcher a few of these French names, but mostly not all of them. Uh, the country of Joan of Arc and Louis XIV, the country of Bonaparte and General de Gaulle, the country of knights and ladies, the country of Victor Hugo and Chateaubriand, 
the country of Pascal and Descartes, the country of the fables of La Fontaine, the characters of Moliere, and the verses of Racine, the country of Notre Dame de Paris and of village church towers, the country of Gavroche and Cosette, the country of barricades in Versailles, the country of Pasteur and Lavoisier, the country of Voltaire and Rousseau, of Clemenceau and the soldiers of 14, of de Gaulle and Jean Moulin, the country of Gabin and Delon, of Brigitte Bardot and Belmondo and Johnny and Daz Navour and Brassens and Barbara, sorry, the films of Sautet and Vernil. This country at the same time lighthearted and illustrious. This country at the same time literary and scientific. This country truly intelligent and one of a kind. The country of the Concorde and nuclear power, the country that invented cinema and the automobile. This country that you search for everywhere with dismay. No, your children are homesick without even having known this country that you cherish, and it is disappearing. You haven't left, and yet you have the feeling of no longer being at home. You have not left your country. Your country left you. You feel yourself foreigners in your own country. You are internal exiles. For a long time, you believed you were the only one to see, to hear, to think, to doubt. You were afraid to say it. You were ashamed of your feelings. For a long time, you dared not say what you were seeing. And above all, you dared not see what you were seeing. And then you said it to your wife, to your husband, to your children, to your father, to your mother, to your friends, to your coworkers, to your neighbors, and then to strangers. And you understood that your feeling of dispossession was shared by everyone. France is no longer France and everyone sees it. Of course, they despised you, the powerful, the elites, the conformists, the journalists, the politicians, the professors, the sociologists, the union bosses, the religious authorities. They told you it's all a ploy. It's all fake. It's all wrong. But you understood in time that it was them who were a ploy, them who had it all wrong, them who did you wrong. The disappearance of our civilization is not the only question that harasses us, although it towers over everything. Immigration is not the cause of all our problems, although it ag aggravates everything. The third worlding of our country and our people impoverishes as much as it disintegrates, ruins as much as it torments. It's why you often have a hard time making ends meet. It's why we must reindustrialize France. It's why we must equalize the balance of trade. It's why we must reduce our growing debt, bring back to France our companies that left, give jobs to our unemployed. It's why we must protect our technological marvels and stop selling them to foreigners. It's why we must allow our small businesses to live and to grow and to pass from generation to generation. It's why we must preserve our architectural, cultural, and natural heritage. It's why we must restore our Republican education, its excellence and its belief in merit, and stop surrendering our children to the experiments of egalitarians and pedagogists and the Dr. Strange loves of gender theory and Islamo leftism. It's why we must take back our sovereignty, abandon to European technocrats and judges who rob the French people of the ability to control their destiny in the name of a fantasy, a Europe that will never be a nation. Yes, we must give power to the people, take it back from the minority that unceasingly tyrannizes the majority and from judges who substitute their judicial rulings for government of the people, for the people, by the people. For decades, our elected officials of the right and the left have led us down this dire path of decline and decadence. Right and left have lied and concealed the gravity of our diminishment. They have hidden from you the reality of our replacement. You have known me for many years. You know what I say, what I diagnose, what I proclaim. I have long been content with the role of journalist, writer, Cassandra, whistleblower. Back then, I believed that a politician would take up the flame that I had lit. I said to myself, to each his own job, to each his own role, to each his own fight, I have lost this illusion. Like you, I have lost confidence. Like you, I have decided to take our destiny in hand. I saw that no politician had the courage to save our country from the tragic fate that awaits it. I saw that all these supposed professionals were above all impotent. That President Macron, who had presented himself as an outsider, was in fact the synthesis of his two predecessors, or worse, that all the parties were contenting themselves with reforms while time passes them by. There is no more time to reform France, but it, there is time to save her. That is why I have decided to run for president. I have decided to ask your votes to become your president of the Republic so that our children and grandchildren do not know barbarism, so that our daughters are not veiled and our sons are not forced to submit, so that we can bequeath to them the France we have known and that we receive from our ancestors, so that we can still preserve our way of life, our traditions, our language, our conversations, our debates about history and fashion, our taste for literature and food, so that the French remain French, proud of their past and confident in their future, so that the French once again feel at home, so that the newest arrivals assimilate their culture adapt their history and are remade as French in France, not foreigners in an unknown land. We, the French, are a great nation, a great people. Our glorious past pleads for our future. 
Our soldiers have conquered Europe and the world. Our writers and artists have aroused universal admiration. Our scientific discoveries and industrial production have stamped their epochs. The charm of our art de vive excites longing and joy in all who taste it. We have known great victories and we have overcome cruel defeats. For a thousand years, we have been one of the powers who have written the history of the world. We are worthy of our ancestors. We will not allow ourselves to be mastered, vassalized, conquered, colonized. We will not allow ourselves to be replaced. In front of us, a cold and determined monster rises up who seeks to dishonor us. They will say that you are racist. They will say that you are motivated by contemptible passions when in fact it is the most lovely passion that animates you, passion for France. They will say the worst about me, that I will keep going amidst the jeers and I don't care if they spit on me. I will never bend the head for we have a mission to accomplish. The French people have been intimidated, crippled, indoctrinated, blamed, but they lift up their heads, they drop the masks, they clear the air of lies, they hunt down these evil perjuries. We are going to carry France on, we are going to pursue the beautiful and noble French adventure, we are going to pass the flame to the coming generations. Join with me, rise up. We, we the French, have always triumphed over all. Long live the Republic, and above all, long live France. Well, that was pretty extraordinary, I would have to say. I don't remember a speech in recent memory uh, that was quite so arresting, urgent, and um, learned in a way, um, and delivered from all people, as you said, a journalist and kind of you know, Fox News show host or the equivalent uh, in France, uh, Eric Zemmour. So this is one to watch. I uh, will see what the French ruling class does with this man. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprising if they tried to throw him in jail for this speech, uh, but perhaps he's gotten too popular uh, for uh, for the French deep state to take him down. Uh, his polling has steadily increased over recent months, and it looks like maybe 30 or 40% of the public is pro Zemmour now. This will be very interesting. Yeah, not to scoop Chris, because that piece is really worth reading. It's, uh, it's France on the verge of civil war. But one of his major takeaways is sort of what you alluded to, Ryan, that this guy is going to have to persuade faster than his opponents can prosecute. Uh, France has no equivalent of the First Amendment. It's become increasingly difficult to say or even think things of the kind that Zemmour is articulating in this speech. And uh, I agree that what strikes one <laughs> perhaps beyond everything is the erudition of it. I mean, he's just simply not what, as as we might predict, they're already making him out to be. I've been scanning some French, you know, news releases of this speech as you were reading it aloud, Ryan, and, you know, everyone features something akin to the phrase, le polémiste d'extrême droite, the, the, the polemicist of the far right. You know, this, this thing that our politicians do informally, where they kind of just block out certain thoughts from acceptable, polite company, French politicians and the French regime now do officially this this cordon sanitaire as they call it the sort of sanitary um you know line that ropes people off from polite society is you know has been this sort of mechanism for for shunting people like this to the side and I, you know one of the other things that that Chris points out in his piece is that the country is basically run by the tiny sliver of people who think everything is going just just fine everything is hunky dory and yeah, I mean, when comes, I, I, he's been called le Trump Francais, the French Trump, but I don't know that Trump could muster that level of literary illusions. I mean, it, yeah. it strikes me as he goes through that list, right? Daznavour and, um, you know, Cosette and this, you know, this enormous profusion, which is, you know, lifted in some sense out of his literary output, which is also quite learned, although admittedly polemical, you know, th th this is not a list of, you know, hardline conservative figures in in French history. Quite to the contrary, it's incredibly diverse in terms of its, you know, these these people and their their political history in France. You know, Zamor is not saying that everybody needs to be like a, you know, fist pounding conservative. He's saying that France should be French. And and this is like a, you know, it it is remarkable that this has become the thing that now is just, you know, forbidden to think or or say, but it's also a salutary reminder of the state of our politics as well, right? I mean, this these sorts of things are also forbidden for us to think and say. And yeah, we'll all kind of watch him with bated breath, I think. So it's it's the restraint of this speech that impressed me the most. What was said in the speech is something that 
was the sort of invisible foundation of all French politics up until very recently, and in fact, all, all politics in the West until fairly recently. Uh, it was the default. It was something that was so foundational that it did not need to be said out loud. Uh, it was, you know, on patriotic occasions, the kind of thing that would be said aloud. Uh, and of course, people would cheer. But, uh, you know, as, as Twitter's CEO recently, as, as we recently discovered, uh, there's still a tweet up there from, from the new CEO saying, uh, you know, the, basically the First Amendment is not our concern. Our concern is how times are changing. Uh, and that spirit, the spirit of, well, you know, times are changing. And so, uh, and so we're, we're going to go forward, uh, which is the, the name of, of Macron's uh, sort of Frankenstein party that he cobbled together uh, as, you know, as the socialists and, and, uh, and the Sarkozy wing of, of the right in France collapsed. So, so you know, Zemmour shows without, uh, without telling really that or, or reserving just a few lines to the fact of the matter that the, those in charge have have willfully and deliberately let go of, of France and have, you know, put a, a stake through its heart as they sort of push it out, out to sea. And he shows and not tells that, that what is replacing it is not something worth pride, not something worth sacrifice, not something that arouses joy or hope in the French breast or, or you know, or in any human breast. Not even uh, the beneficiaries of, you know, decreased social and cultural prejudice. Uh, you go around and, and ask, you know, the, the generations of migrants in France uh, whether they're particularly happy with life. And I suspect strongly that, uh, you know, they, as, as devout people do, um, insofar as they are devout, take uh, refuge and draw nourishment from their religion. Uh, but th this is not their utopia either. Um, in fact, it is no one's utopia, uh, and it is becoming a no place. That the way in which Zamora was able to get this across without spelling it out and trying to explain it, um, I think is important and powerful. Uh, people know they, as as he suggested, they know what is happening, uh, and they are are getting to a point where uh, they they must speak about it. They need to hear a voice outside their head acknowledging uh, what they what they recognize to be true. And so, you know, you don't have to uh, you don't have to sound like like Donald Trump or like any sort of television personality as we know them in America in order to uh, in order to say the obvious and to say it in a way that um, that ordinary people can very, very quickly and instinctively fill in the blanks um, with with regard to. And I would expect that there will be more of this kind of talk. Uh, and not just from Zamor. Um, and uh, and it, the importance of all this is, you know, it's it's one thing to ban speech or to punish speech uh, that kind of leans toward the caricature of the the raving pundit or you know the Alex Jones or whatever. It's easy to say this person is you know just out of control and clownish, and you know we society won't be the worse without them. But it's another thing entirely to ban and punish speech of the sort that is contained in this speech. Uh, speech that really just holds up a mirror of truth to what is really happening. Uh, and if that kind of speech starts to come under the ban hammer in France or anywhere else, then things will really, really heat up. You know, what I find interesting is that the only speech I can think of that resembles this uh, is a speech that Trump made in Poland, mm -hmm. uh, celebrating Polish nationalism, where he said, you know, Poland prevailed. Poland will always prevail. Um, you know, I guess it's in Eastern Europe, you're still allowed to praise your country, praise like your national identity, to acknowledge national identity. Uh, so, you know, in a weird way, Trump had to go to Warsaw in order to <laughs> really, really speak this. I mean, I keep coming back to this question of like immigration. And I feel like, I mean, in a certain way, immigration is the only question anymore. Like, it's the only serious question that's facing the world. And opposition to the principle of open borders, free movement of people anywhere they want to go. Uh, I mean, that's really the third rail in Western politics now. And that's really what animates the elites. 
uh, the most, I think. And I think that's really what they hated Trump for. Um, this idea that a nation has the right to determine its own population and to decide who comes in is intolerable. So it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, with Zamora. I mean, I see France 24 already saying, oh, he's, 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 his popularity is in decline. Nobody likes him. Uh, they want somebody really presidential. I mean, I don't really know. I mean, who knows? What, I mean, they're kind of like the CNN of, um, of France, I guess. So uh, it'll be very interesting to watch. Uh, and, you know, I should, he, he was born in France. He's not, I mean, correct? Yes, I mean, yeah. yes yeah. yeah, I didn't, sorry, I didn't mean to imply that he was. No, no, no. Yeah. But um, yeah. just, just by um, sort of nationality and religion, he's, you know, originally from yeah, a true. former French colony. Yeah. Right, right. Um, no, so it's, you know, it's fascinating. It's ancestor, fascinating, right? and, uh, fascinating development. Well, like many people of foreign background, including, I think, our own Angelo Cotavilla, he looked around him and, you know, because he, in some sense, came from outside, saw the national character of France, right? I mean, what we're, what we're talking around here is, in addition to the, you know, the, the logistical fact of, of borders and immigration, the, the reason that that is getting to people isn't just the, you know, the disrespect for the rule of law that it represents to throw the gates open wide and let people come in, but the dilution of, uh, of national character and national culture. It doesn't matter actually if you're taking in a gajillion like nice immigrants, if they're doing things in a radically different way to what you're used to, to what you, you know, honor and believe in, uh, to, you know, to, to love one's own is natural. And as, as Zamor intimates in that speech, a, a beautiful and valuable thing that, you know, helps us to, to form bonds of civic friendship with one another. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's almost taboo to suggest that national characters exist or that they can be diluted in an undesirable way by too much rapid change of any kind. I mean, Seth, the other speech that comes to mind in addition to that Warsaw one is, I, I think that was one of Trump's two greatest speeches. And the other one was the one he made at the National Garden of American Heroes or announcing rather the National Garden of American Heroes. And that was an American character speech. It was, you know, in the context of the 2020 summer riots, he basically put his foot down and the said, speech at Mount Rushmore or delivered in front of Mount yeah, Rushmore. Yeah, Spencer. exactly. The Mount Rushmore speech, uh, you know, and said, these are our, you know, these are, these are our people. We honor them. We, we, you know, we, we, we do things a certain way. We think that's good. We think that's, you know, excellent. Um, and what struck me at the time about that speech in contrast to the Warsaw one is, you know, how, how late in the game it came. It really felt at that point as if things were already crumbling around Trump's shoulders. And it was, it was, disappointing and sad that it took him that long, both in the context of summer 2020 and in the context of his presidency to put his finger on what people were yearning for, what, you know, with no malice, with no atavism, with with no kind of, none of the evil nasty isms that people are accused of or deplorables are, are labeled with, but simply with natural and wholesome love for home, for how home looks, for how home sounds and acts, right? Um, yeah, it, it did take Trump that long to be able to put that into words. And by then it was too late. Hey, um, perhaps now this might be this is a real long shot. This, you're going to call this a stretch, but perhaps our Eric Zamor is Mehmet Oz. <laughs> <laughs> is that Dr. Oz? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't okay, that be interesting? We're, we're all listening with eyebrows. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know what? I just noticed that Steve Schmidt, you know, that of the, the loser Lincoln project. Yeah. He came out really hard arguing that uh, Mehmet Oz is is constitutionally uh, disallowed from serving in the Senate because he's a he's a dual citizen huh. and bringing up all of this like crazy sort of like you know, tra traitor talk. It was very weird, uh, but it, it, it kind of indicated something like, oh, well, if the Lincoln Project is freaking out about Dr. O's, maybe there's something good going on there. Yeah. But, you know, look, that, that was kind of, um, that was half facetious. Yeah, yeah. No, as we were discussing pre-show, <clears throat> I think we all agreed. I mean, you could certainly see someone like Tucker Carlson who tracks 
a little more closely was Moore's biography giving a speech like this. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, anyway, everyone should check out the CRB essay from Chris Caldwell. Really, you should read everything Chris Caldwell writes. And uh, we'll keep an eye on Zemmour. Um, when is the French, French, the French presidential election? It should be next fall. Is that right? I can't remember the scheduling of French elections. You guys don't have to answer that. I don't need to put you on the spot. I think they have a two-tiered system. Right. They do a general That's runoff. right. <clears throat> right. Uh, he has to it, clear the first hurdle. Right. In April. So, uh, Sunday, April 10th, says Google. And then April 24th, I guess, is the second. Excellent. Thank you. That seems to be it. The virtues of sitting in front of computers recording podcasts. Yeah. But what, people think we actually know stuff? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we wanted to talk uh, about anti-vaxxers a bit. It was spurred by this Ann Coulter tweet that... Uh, that Seth brought back to my attention. What was the exact tweet, Seth? I forget. Well, it's in reference to the death of this um, this guy Lamb, who's a oh the pastor, a pastor, Preacher, yes. Yeah. And she yeah. said, um, "Let me see what exactly she said." She said, "Christian, like he died, okay, and he was like right. an anti vaxxer And she tweeted, "Like this is getting embarrassing. Uh, Christians over fifty. Uh, just get get vaccinated already, you know. Va- basically, that's what she said. Uh, and I just thought it was interesting. I mean, we we've talked a lot about the vaccine from the perspective of mandates and the relative constitutionality or the the tyranny implicit. But you know, I wonder what do we what do we have to say about anti-vax? I mean. Look, I'm not in favor of mandates, but at the same time, you know, it doesn't, I mean, they have given out billions of these things. It's not quite clear to me that people are actually dropping dead left and right from vaccines. Uh, I don't know if it works. You know, I, I, I accept the, the fact that, like, that it's an imperfect vaccine, but, you know, I'm not so sure it's worth waging a war against the principle of vaccination or even this vaccine. Uh, so I was just wondering what everybody thought about it. And Coulter, you know, came out pretty strong saying like, this is idiotic not to get vaccinated basically. Right. Yeah. It's um, I, I think that, I mean, the main problem with it rhetorically for the ruling class seems to be they've gotten well ahead of their skis on this. I mean, look, if the, uh, we've talked about all this, many times in the podcast, but if this were more deadly, even if you're over 50, if you're in fairly decent shape uh, and taking care of yourself, I mean, it's it's a little more deadly than the flu, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, as we've joked before, you know, it's not Ebola or anything. And uh, they their original pitch was that the vaccine, if you got the vaccine, you wouldn't get COVID. That's not true. Uh, if you got the vaccine, you wouldn't transmit COVID. Also not true. And so it seems to me that it's, it's, it's kind of the, the arguments they're making for the mandate and then the implied argument, meaning you're basically a bad person if you don't get it, just don't, don't um, stack up anymore because really what you're getting it for now um, is uh, it, it seems pretty clear that it reduces severe cases and reduces deaths. So really you're getting it for yourself. And the, you know, the, the broad anti-vax language is unhelpful as well because uh, the history of anti-vax in this country has a lot, to do, a lot to do with parents being worried about getting their children vaccinated. And uh, it's clear that there's really not much reason to get children vaccinated for COVID, especially if they're, they're uh, under 18 and, you know, really anyone under 40. It's kind of a, a mild prophylactic against severe disease. If, you know, if you're really overweight or you have a you know, early onset diabetes or something, uh, you know, all sorts of comorbidities that, that makes, makes sense, even if you're younger, but to, the need to mandate it as a lot of these states are doing included the, my beloved here uh, and sad state of California. I mean, you know, if the, if the ruling class gets its way, it's going to want to vax uh, soon, require it for anyone over five, as soon as they approve that. I don't think they have yet, or maybe it's in the works. And then I saw some Somebody on Twitter, not nah, not a random person. It was like Ezra Klein or just somebody at Vox. Uh, I forget who. It doesn't really matter. 
but they were sort of excited about, yes, once they approve the five and up one, then they'll move on to six months and up. And it's just, the, this, the whole thing is so mad. I don't know why, why Coulter would want to pile on in this way, although she does like being a kind of contrarian on the right, you know, on Trump or anything else. So it's, it's sort of a piece with all that. But um, yeah, the zeal against the, quote, the COVID vaccine, vaccine skeptics seems to me to have run well beyond any reasonable assessment of, of what, what people refusing to get vaccinated will do to their friends, family, and fellow citizens, which is not much. Yeah, I mean, it's almost Ann Coulter's job to say things in a maximally offensive way, whatever whatever opinion she's stating. She's, first of all, a phenomenal writer, and second of all, just knows how to get a rise out of people. So, I mean, I, I'm more interested in this question, right, of, of yeah, anti-vaxxing as a, as a thing. Like, the, I, am, I am less impressed by the actual medical concerns that people are raising, except in some cases, I think, you know, pregnant women or people trying to get pregnant uh, have some some reason to, you know, wonder and wait. But I, I'm much less impressed by all of the, like, you might get heart disease stuff than by the just very natural human impulse to thumb your nose at these cretins who have gotten everything wrong, lied about getting everything wrong, and then berated us as if we were murderers for pointing that out, and now are making yet another invasive personal demand about us, which we will be, you know, excommunicated if we don't obey. Like, I just think that it's, it's, it's hard to get over how offensive that is to people. And I would suspect that underneath a lot of the, you know, research and conspiracy theories that people are coming up with about how this vaccine will kill you is just that very understandable and natural sentiment that like these these people are 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 slime and we shouldn't listen to them. And we hate that they're telling us what to do and acting like it's their right to tell us what to do. And, you know, just screw you. Like I I think most people, that's the barrier that they're getting over in order to get vaccinated, if it's anything. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to do this as dispassionately as <laughs> I can here. Since, since we entered into this, this cyborg world that we now all live in, the, the whole meaning of a vaccine has changed. The whole cultural and civilizational context surrounding what a vaccine is and what it does and what it's for and its role in statecraft has been transformed. And people are aware of this. Uh, it, it's, it's a difficult thing to, uh, to articulate for people who's, you know, who are not paid to sit around thinking about things and writing about them all day. Uh, you know, Agamben managed to write a lot of this stuff down and it resonated with people across the, the quote unquote political spectrum because, you know, the, the division of the French parliament into to left side and right side uh, is, is simply not an adequate analogy to capture the way in which uh, biopolitics and technopolitics uh, circa 2021 uh, is, is organized. And so it's, it's hard for people to, to articulate the reality that they see unfolding all around them. Uh, they oftentimes don't even have the time or the, the, the resources to, uh, to articulate these things. And, uh, you know, are, despite the fact that many of them use social media are unlikely to spend so much time on social media that they can work it into their routine to write, you know, 4,000 word screeds and post them on the internet, uh, simply to express, uh, a fact of the matter that they have to put all of their energy into trying to wrestle with in their practical life on a daily basis. But above and beyond that, even if you do manage to find the time and the, the wherewithal to say out loud what everyone knows to be true, which is that uh, the use of a vaccine in a, a, a time when technology is eating away political life is fundamentally different from what it was before. Uh, surprise, surprise, the regime itself does not want you to talk about these things. It does not want you to say these things. It does not want you to log on and to say, isn't it interesting that the people who have the most entrenched interests and are agitating the hardest for the use of the vaccine as a pretext for constructing a new regime around us that is a fundamental break with our way of life and our form of government, isn't it curious that those people are the transparently mentally ill and uh, and public officials who were not voted into office and cannot be voted out. 
these are the people who are proposing to rule our new regime. And these are the people who have the, the, the strongest, most acute interest in using the politics of the vaccine uh, and COVID politics more broadly to, uh, to entrench their form of rule um, by doing an end run around political activity as such, around citizen politics. You got Fauci standing up there saying, I represent science. I am the science, you know, like, uh, like Judge Dredd saying, I am the law. And this is, this is the example of who our new rulers should be, who they, who they believe they already are. Under these conditions, you know, the meaning of a vaccine as such changes and the meaning of a vaccine like this one, where, you know, if this thing was a one and done, everyone would have gotten it by now. If this thing was a two and done, it would still be quite high. Uh, but it's two and then it's a booster and then it's another booster and it's, you know, it is penetrating the barrier of the body and uh, invading uh, at a molecular level um, our very human being, y y not simply with with quote unquote science, uh, not at all just with science, uh, but with people, people who do not share our interests, people who frankly do not share our civilization. Uh, who insist upon invading our bodies so as to control us in a fundamentally new way uh, that has only become possible over the past several years technologically. Um, this is what the regime does not want you saying. I was a little surprised that in Google's new announcement of the uh, newly restrictive rules for YouTube on what you are permitted to say on YouTube with regard to the virus did not include uh, what I'm just describing, but it seems to be only a matter of time uh, especially in countries like France, where there is no First Amendment. Um, in many of these places in the West, there's simply nothing to stop a government from saying, you cannot, by law, describe uh, the regime COVID policy as an attack on our form of government and our way of life. I, given the current trajectory, we should expect that this will start to happen. And so there's already a chilling effect. And there's already you know, reason for, for ordinary Americans to, uh, you know, to, to speak much more obliquely than they would like to, and to take their eyes off of the ball of what they know to be the central political issue of the moment, which is the construction of this new regime. Uh, and so there's a dangerous double game being played here, you know, where, where the regime gets to propagandize just as very hard as it wants, uh, using every megaphone and, um, and every source of publicity that it can. And yet the people whose humanity and whose authority as citizens must be overthrown in order for this revolution to work are muzzled and are silenced. Um, this is an untenable situation. This is a choice between two very different regime forms. And, uh, you know, it, it is coming to a head. Uh, uh, what we are seeing now is simply, you know, the outworking of, of what's already been, been baked into the cake. So there is still time to avert a catastrophe uh, and we'll see what happens next year politically. Um, but it is just it is just evident that uh, that the reason why so many people are sour and suspicious with regard to the vaccine is because they know that COVID is being used deliberately and openly by, uh, you know, by an international alliance of people in charge who simply want to uh, uh, transform technologically uh, the way we live um, in our political system. Uh, at odds with what has come before. And what has come before is, you know, natural law, natural right, representative government, freedom of speech, very simple stuff. Uh, but as was the case with Zamor, you know, simply saying these things out loud and saying that we should be proud of them and that they belong to us and that we have a duty to maintain them um, is veering toward, you know, uh, a speech crime. Yeah, or, uh, or blasphemy, right? So that you mentioned Fauci as science, James. I just reread, so he was on Face the Nations when he said this. And it's really cosmological language at the tail end of this quote. He says, it's easy to criticize, but they're really criticizing science because I represent science. That's dangerous, he said. To me, that's more dangerous than the slings and arrows that get thrown at me. I'm not going to be around here forever, but science is going to be here forever. <laughs> uh, so there's Fauci, along with Aristotle, arguing for the uh, eternal nature of nature. Uh, I, I doubt he means it that way, but the, the way that our authorities have approached this, both in restricting speech and, and their rhetoric, especially the more leading edge activists on this, it, is a, it has taken on, uh, to take up one of your longstanding themes, James, has taken on a kind of religious quality. Yeah, I mean, my favorite response to that Fauci quote was, <laughs> quote, 
I represent science, end quote, said nobody who believes in science ever. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the transparency now of the way these statements get made. And in fact, as, as you rightly intimated, Ryan, that's the inverse of what somebody like Aristotle would say, right? I mean, this is like a pure cult of personality, subverting the idea. I mean, leaving aside my own sort of blasé attitude about people's concerns about the virus, it's at least the case that this is a highly novel technology about which scientific debate is very much still in operation. And there's another area in which the, what's really going on, as James has now eloquently said, is that like the politics are making it impossible to even articulate the fact that that debate is existing. There are all sorts of places where this is true. It's not just about coronavirus. In in discussion, for example, of you know how race works and how the genetics of race works, it, there have been two totally parallel tracks going on. One, a very reasoned and measured debate among certain scientists who want to find out what the role is of DNA in the you know evolution of, of the human organism, and who all you know stipulate that of course it's nothing to do with how we should treat people as equal under the law and so forth. And then another hysterical caterwauling about you know how we can't say certain things, can't think certain things. The 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 fever pitch of this in the COVID area is 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 striking i mean this is not at all anything related to what we think of when we think about the scientific process or going back further natural science i mean fundamentally what we're dealing with here is a society that has eliminated the realm of metaphysics that which is beyond meta the physical or the natural so to speak physique and so natural scientists who used to be one not particularly elevated kind of philosopher have now become the only kind of philosopher or authority on the things of this world and supposedly beyond although they don't believe in such things they are priest, they are cleric, they are philosopher, they are God. That's what they want. And they believe themselves to be this because they don't believe there to be anything beyond the natural world, which their grand theories and designs describe. They've simply appointed themselves as rulers over a mechanical universe that they intend to manipulate, us included. The power of, as C.S. Lewis said, the power of man over nature is always the power of some men over other men using nature, Fauci considers himself a representative certainly of that ideal. And in order for that to work, he has to become the priest of the, the new state religion. Amen. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, you, you can you can quote Max Weber on this, you know, like, oh, science and politics. These are two different vocations and the scientists can do lots of great stuff. But what they can't do is tell the politicians what they should do. This, you know, a yeah. hundred years ago was was considered the received wisdom of the leading political scientists in the West, and it's just being vaporized. Uh, you know, technology is a hell of a drug, and uh, you can just see the way in which it is reshaping people uh, so as to just walk away, you know, not just from their heritage, their, you know, blood and soil or country or flag or whatever that, you know, fill in the blank, um, but to walk away from, you know, from the basic principles and precepts that have kept their civilization going all these many years. Uh, they are, they're walking over a cliff and, and it's hard not to get the impression that, you know, that many people in some, some bizarre sense are, are looking forward to that feeling of drop. Having said all that, let's move on to the West Coast. There's this interesting story out of Beverly Hills. I want to preface this uh, whole segment, our last one, just by saying this goes to me under the heading of expensive coastal California is a scam, uh, especially sort of greater Los Angeles, San Francisco, and uh, San Diego's not quite as bad yet, but it's getting there. Uh, they've had an exploding homeless population as well in recent years. But this story out of Beverly Hills of, of Jacqueline Avant, I'm just reading a couple paragraphs from KCRA, uh, a Los Angeles philanthropist and the wife of music legend Clarence, Clarence Avant was fatally shot in Beverly Hills, California, early Wednesday. That was about 2.20 a.m., according to authorities and a Netflix spokeswoman. Avant's daughter, Nicole, is married to Ted Sarandos, Netflix co-CEO and chief content officer, so that's why Netflix got involved a bit. Um, her husband, Clarence Avant, is known as the godfather of black music and was recently inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Former President Barack Obama and Vice President Kamala Harris were among those who praised his work in a video made for the introduction ceremony in October. Uh, skipping ahead, and this will be my final quote, the suspect or suspects fled the scene and have not been found, Beverly Hills Police said in a news release. So, I mean, by scam, I mean 
you know, this is Beverly Hills is one of the oldest uh, semi old money neighborhoods and richest neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Um, a lot of these neighborhoods are now term- turning to private security to augment their normal police forces. Beverly Hills police had always been pretty vigilant of their um, their geese laying the golden eggs of, of high income and high consumption and property taxes and all the rest. But the, the idea that um, this also, we take this in the context of the kind of rolling collapse of order in New York that uh, Seth has written about and we've talked about before. Beverly Hills of all places, Santa Monica as well. Uh, I have an acquaintance of my wife's who just bought a, uh, Oh, you know, 1900 square foot or so bungalow uh, on the Santa Monica, on the sort of Santa Monica edge of Venice and a great neighborhood, wonderful restaurants to walk to. Um, But down the street, there's a homeless encampment along one street. uh, And that 1900 square foot house sold for over a thousand dollars square feet, about one point nine million dollars. This is unsustainable, it seems to me. It's easy to say that as it continues to go along and housing prices continue to rise. But at a certain point, you think that um, the blush would be fully off this rose and everyone would be fleeing, uh, not just the middle class. So it'll be interesting to watch this. But I thought this was pretty striking, you know, a home invasion from what it looks like, gunshot wound in the middle of the night, killing somebody, uh, you know, a sort of paragon of philanthropy in her community, uh, you know, who's, it's not like she was shot for any reason. I mean, at 80 years old, I doubt she was presenting that much of an obstacle. Um, it's pretty, uh, pretty arresting. Yeah, I, I think that this is what makes this particular story of crime in California, you know, among all of the others, so shocking is just we have this, even those of us who know that, you know, crime levels have become are reaching disastrous levels that, you know, openly the leadership of states like California are disavowing the very notion of enforcing the law and, uh, you know, announcing their intention not to prosecute certain crimes, all of that, you know, we can know all of that and still have this kind of comfortable illusion that like, well, it's a big city with some some very rough neighborhoods. And there are also pockets of places where you can go and, you know, be basically safe. And this is a story about just one such pocket in which somebody waltzes into a millionaire's mansion and just kills them. You know, I mean, the, it reminds me of this piece we put out a while back when we were running a feature about California by Carol Silver. It's called Los Angeles City of Dreams. And she recounts from several years earlier this this story of, you know, moving to Los Angeles and being appalled from the outside at what a hellscape it was and finally taking refuge in Beverly Hills by going to like work in this little coffee shop where she's promptly accosted by a crazy person wielding a knife. So, I mean, this is not like a new phenomenon. It's, it's, I, I think a sobering reminder that when you, when you give up the rule of law, you give it up for everybody. That's precisely the nature of law is that like whatever you do to it applies to everybody. And sure, you can maybe hope to make a bajillion dollars and hire a private security service and like, you know, arm your house with gun wielding men ready to defend you at all costs. But like, that's a description of living in a war zone, which is effectively, it sounds like what this has become. I mean, the thing is, um, regarding like urban crime, um, and the idea, okay, well, now it's it's going to have to reach a, a point where people will say, this is, this is, this is, we have to, we have to put an end to this or we have to leave. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure, like from what I gather, the restaurants, the fancy restaurants in San Francisco are packed. People are going out. Probably the same thing in Los Angeles. Um, I mean, there's no reason at all why the United States couldn't go, like, follow the Brazil model. I mean, Brazil has had, like, Six fifty thousand murders this year. I mean, that's like four or five times the number we've had here. Like, the police have killed over six thousand people in Brazil, like per year. That's like half the number of murders here. Um, and there's still plenty of, you know, beautiful people, rich people, billionaires, millionaires. Everybody just has private security. You know, you have you you. You get your car, your, your Mercedes outfitted with aftermarket, like, you know, um, blow torches and yeah, things fl- like flame that. Yeah. <laughs> Flamethrowers or, or whatever. And you just live life that way. You, div- you, you, you build, um, you know, security rooms, safe rooms in your house with, you know, gates that roll down automatically. Uh, you have 
bodyguards for your children. It just becomes another cost of living. I mean, it's probably really not pleasant to be in the middle class where it's hard to afford that type of thing. But I mean, isn't that where it looks like we're headed in that direction? I mean, as long as politically we don't, you know, improve improve our our choices of uh, elected officials and prosecutors and so forth yeah it's i think we'll be headed there in some places seth as you say we still have a long way to go for full brazilification or south african south africanization but um uh and you know circumstances different everywhere of course with demographics and everything else but um the uh there's already a backlash in some places so we'll see how uh, durable the adjustment to try to fix this is, for example, Oakland is like opening another police academy, it looks like, and maybe trying to double the amount of cops in the street after their failed experiment with depolicing. Um, so yeah, it'll be a patchwork across the country. I just, it's particularly galling in these places where, you know, you're spending a thousand dollars a square foot, you know, you're, especially the, even the upper middle class, you know, sort of scrimping and saving and stretching to buy a, their dream family home. And then, uh, you know, there was a story a few months ago, maybe we mentioned on the podcast, but some some father was with his family in Venice and some lunatic homeless person slashed his his face with a knife and he ended up losing an eye in the whole process. You know, it's a, that's a hell of a way to spend a sunny Southern California beach vacation. Um, this uh, probably a lot of people probably know this book, but Sam Schellen, or I don't actually know his first name is Sam, but Schellenberger, who's written this book, San Francisco. He's kind of a man of the left in many ways. He's he's uh, been one of these guys who's made a, a living kind of uh, being rationally skeptical of some of the claims of his political tribe. Uh, you know, he's been a climate change skeptic or just tried to introduce some some sober, sobriety into that debate from as a man of the left. But he's written this this new book on San Francisco, and the the story up there is the one of rampant homelessness, um, the progressive. Uh, homeless advocates in the city seem to have prevailed for the last five to 10 years or so. And they, this problem has really grown and spread and metastasized. I think 30% of America's homeless live in California now. Um, and uh, it's linked to this problem I wanted to bring up because it's just interesting. Um, another uh, sort of more re- repertorial book, both are really, I mean, Michelle Enberger goes out and interviews a lot of these homeless people it's one extraordinary story he tells. He's t- he has a subsect too, which is worth worth looking at. Michael Schellenberger, I think it is. Um, but he interviewed some some guy, and uh, the guy he asked, you know, why why did you come to San Francisco, or why did you come to the tent city? And uh, he says, uh, I came here to die. Um, he said, Well, what do you mean by that? He's like, Well, well, we all come here to die. You know, we all know that we eventually will lose this gam- gamble with fentanyl, uh, and we'll die. And he's like, I- I've been revived five times. So I have died five times. Um, I may be confusing books now. The other book I wanted to mention is Sam Quinones's book called The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. And I'll just end with this revelation to me, maybe some of our listeners already knew this, of Sam's, which is in about 09 or 08 in Mexico, which is a, a huge producer of methamphetamines for the U.S. market, for the, from the cartels, of course, easy to deduce why. They banned ephedra sales uh, in bulk or in, they just really cut down the sale of ephedra, uh, which was the main ingredient of the kind of the older kind of party meth. And so they made a new kind of meth that was more like chemically intensive, uh, maybe think of Breaking Bad, at least uh, as a reference, reference point, uh, more chemically intensive way of manufacturing meth. And what Canona has found out from former addicts is the meth changed completely in a way it was no longer a social drug. It was now a uh, one that really sent you into your own head, uh, accelerated your hallucinations. It, it, it leads much more quickly after heavy use to schizophrenia. And so he, he posits that the tent cities are in a way, the blossoming of them sort of grew up with this new meth because you want to be in an dr- open air drug community. You want to be able to get it. The tent cities, there's some community there. You're not just alone. But when you do this new meth, you really, really must be in your own little space. So the tent is perfect. Uh, it's just an interesting piece of reporting and connecting of dots that I just never really had thought of. 
I think the safe neighborhoods now are red states is the <laughs> is the moral of the story, right? Like, I mean, it does, it sort of seems as if like rule of law optional is kind of the governing thesis here. Well, in New York, uh, de Blasio just opened up uh, America's first drug, well, I guess what he calls overdose prevention centers, uh, which are, you know, drug in injection sites, what they call safe injection sites, where you can go and, um, you know, bring your drugs in and do them and, and be revived when you um, overdose, which happened five times uh, yesterday on, on the first day, like someone overdosed and then were revived. Um, and it's funny because we, the, the claim keeps being made that this is all science-based, data-driven. But I looked at the overdose numbers in Vancouver and Toronto, where these centers have been operational for years now, and um, their, their death by overdose rates are soaring. So, you know, I mean, maybe they would be much higher if they didn't have these sites, but I'm not so sure that the regularization of this type of thing, like the harm reduction model, yeah. I don't see a lot of evidence for its uh, success. Well, and the, I mean, the moral proposition, because uh, us as good Aristotelians, you know, everything is undertaken for the sake of some good, uh, every action. But the moral proposition behind providing a safe place for your fellow citizens to poison themselves, and should they do it a little too much and bring themselves to the brink of death, then you revive them and presumably let them do it again the next day is, is a pretty sick proposition, it seems to me. I think even regardless of its efficacy, uh, just morally, it seems monstrous. Absolutely. It's perverse. Well, all right. On that high note, we shouldn't go out. So we should say something uh, more uplifting while we're, while we're here. Well, our last one, what we recorded right before Thanksgiving. So uh, I, I hope everyone had a lovely Thanksgiving. We were uh, riffing on each of ours uh, before this. We had, I had a wonderful week of cooking with my wife. Uh, it helps to be married to a former chef and uh, delicious food was had by all. And for the first time, I think ever, we made all of our leftovers into cool dishes. Some turkey enchiladas, uh, turkey pot pie, I must say, I think is the king of leftovers, especially if you make your own pie crust. It's easy when you make your pie crust for your pies, just make more than you need and then use it for turkey pot pie after that. So uh, culinary tips, maybe a first for the American, for the American Minds Roundtable. But uh, I hear from you all that you had lovely Thanksgivings, and I hope our listeners did too. And with that, uh, I want to thank you all for listening to the Roundtable. If you want to support our work, visit claremont.org slash donate. And if you want to learn more about all our projects and writing, visit our websites at americanmind.org, claremont.org, claremontreviewbooks.com, and our Washington, D.C. Center for the American Way of Life at dc.claremont.org. Please rate and rate us well. Share and subscribe at Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to Jake Gannon and Annalisa Lee for all their production and engineering work. And thank you all for listening. Talk to you next week.